Hello, and welcome to Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm your host, life coach and psychotherapist, Nikki Eisenhower. And on today's episode, I'm discussing Stephen King, HSPs, empaths, and high sensation seeking. I want to introduce this as a concept or a segment or a theme that I might return to. It's a pretty common question. You might be familiar with it, but it's kind of the question of if you could have a dinner party with any people throughout history, dead or alive, who would it be? And on my short list, I've got Einstein, Maya Angelou, Gilda Radner, Margaret Atwood, Dr. Martin Luther King, Marianne Williamson, Stephen King, and Freud. And my grandmother and her first love. I'd like to have all of them together. I'd like to sit back and just watch them (laughs) interacting with each other. And it might be weird. I'm highly sensitive, right? I'm talking about Stephen King. We all know Stephen King as the writer of the scary things. And now I'm high sensation seeking. So my guess is that those of you who lean high sensation seeking are like, oh, yeah, hell yeah. Like, I like a good scare. We like that. We like the sensation of that. And I don't just learn as a highly sensitive person from pure light, high vibe. I think I learn from darkness. I even believe that part of why people feel a trustworthiness when they hear my voice or when they connect with me in person is because I've explored my shadow self. I learn from the darkness. I allow that. I don't deny that part of the human existence. And somehow or some way that translates into me being someone that you can trust with your dark things. I learn from the exploration versus the denial of my shadow self. And I invite you to do the same too. I enjoy the range of my emotions. And the ability to feel a little scared, a little titillated, and to imagine someone else's world the way that Stephen King paints a world, it's a fun, exciting kind of escapism. And it gives me the exercise and the muscles, the strengthening of these muscles to close down fear. If I get too scared, it's a pretty awesome practice for me to be able to shut a Stephen King book and go, that's enough right now. What a boundary and what an empowered thing for my inner child, my inner psyche, my inner self to be able to say, that's enough. I'm done. Or I'm only going to read that in the light of day. It's a little too spooky in the twilight hours. This is a way that I get to practice emotional enoughness. I enjoy this challenging of my own fears and how vibrantly I'll allow myself to visually create the world as painted by an author. I'm going to set the stage a little bit and read a small excerpt from Stephen King's The Shining. Now, The Shining is a very famous movie. I am assuming many of you listening to this have heard this. I don't think I'm going to give any spoilers away. And I just want to say that the book seems to be a lot different than the movie, which is often what happens. We know this. But if this is about to be a spoiler for you, don't listen to this part and fast forward. This is the part of the story where the family, it's a mom and a dad and a little boy who I believe is five years old. And they've just arrived at the big hotel. The hotel's clearing out for the winter and the family's going to be left there alone, snowed in, unable to get away from the hotel. So Danny, who they also call Doc as a nickname, has arrived and the head cook is meeting the family and giving them the tour of the kitchen. And the parents, particularly the mom, steps back and really watches how the cook and her son, Danny, are connecting. The mom witnesses the cook, Mr. Halloran, call Danny Doc his nickname. And it registers for her that no one has called him Doc in his presence. So the mom is starting to pick up on there's a little bit of knowing that's happening. And she's watching her son connect very naturally with Mr. Halloran. 
Mr. Halloran invites Danny to come to the car to help him put his luggage in the car. And Danny jumps in the car with him. And I'm going to start reading. In the car, Halloran was saying, Get you kind of lonely thinking you were the only one? Danny, who had been frightened as well as lonely sometimes, nodded. Am I the only one you ever met? He asked. Good boy, Halloran said. He produced a large key ring from the pocket of his blue serge jacket and unlocked the trunk. As he lifted the bags in, he said, You shine on, boy. Harder than anyone I ever met in my life, and I'm 60 years old this January. Huh? You got a knack, Halloran said, turning to him. Me, I've always called it shining. That's what my grandmother called it, too. She had it. We used to sit in the kitchen when I was a boy no older than you and have long talks without even opening our mouths. Really? Halloran smiled at Danny's open-mouthed, almost hungry expression and said, Come on up and sit in the car with me for a few minutes. Want to talk to you. He slammed the trunk. In the car, Halloran was saying, Get you kind of lonely, thinking you were the only one? Danny, who had been frightened as well as lonely sometimes, nodded. Am I the only one you ever met? he asked. Halloran laughed and shook his head. No, child, no, but you shine the hardest. Are there lots then? No, Halloran said, but you do run across them. A lot of folks, they got a little bit of shine to them. They don't even know it. But they always seem to show up with flowers when their wives are feeling blue with the monthlies. They do good on school tests they don't even study for. They got a good idea how people are feeling as soon as they walk into a room. I come across 50 or 60 like that, but maybe only a dozen counting my gram that knew they were shining. Wow, Danny said and thought about it. Then, do you know Miss Brandt? Her? Halloran asked scornfully, she don't shine, just sends her supper back two, three times every night. I know she doesn't, Danny said earnestly, but do you know the man in the gray uniform that gets the cars? Mike? Sure, I know Mike. What about him? Mr. Halloran, why would she want his pants? What are you talking about, boy? Well, when she was watching him, she was thinking she would sure like to get into his pants, and I just wondered why but he got no further. Halloran had thrown his head back and rich, dark laughter issued from his chest, rolling around in the car like cannon fire. The seat shook with the force of it. Danny smiled, puzzled, and at last the storm subsided by fits and starts. Halloran produced a large silk handkerchief from his breast pocket with a white flag of surrender and wiped his streaming eyes. Boy, he said, still snorting a little, You are going to know everything there is to know about the human condition before you make 10. I don't know if to envy you or not. But Miss Brandt, you never mind her, he said. And don't go asking your mom either. You'd only upset her. Dig what I'm saying? Yes, sir, Danny said. He dug it perfectly well. He had upset his mother that way in the past. That Miss Brant is just a dirty old woman with an itch. That's all you have to know. He looked at Danny speculatively. How hard can you hit, Doc? Huh? Give me a blast. Think at me. I want to know if you got as much as I think you do. What do you want me to think? Anything. Just think it hard. Okay, Danny said. He considered it for a moment, then gathered his concentration and flung it at Halloran. He had never done anything precisely like this before. And at the last instant, some instinctive part of him rose up and blunted some of the thought's raw force. He didn't want to hurt Mr. Halloran. Still, the thought arrowed out of him with a force he never would have believed. It went like a Nolan Ryan fastball with a little extra on it. Gee, I hope I don't hurt him. And the thought was... Hi, Dick. Halloran winced and jerked backward on the seat. His teeth came together with a hard click, drawing blood from his lower lip in a thin trickle. His hands flew up involuntarily from his lap to the level of his chest and then settled back again. For a moment, his eyelids fluttered limply with no conscious control, and Danny was frightened. Mr. Halloran? Dick, are you okay? 
I don't know, Halloran said and laughed weakly. I honest to God don't. My God, boy, you're a pistol. I'm sorry, Danny said, more alarmed. Should I get my daddy? I'll run and get him. No, 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 no. Here I come. I'm okay, Danny. You just sit right there. I feel a little scrambled, that's all. I didn't go as hard as I could, Danny confessed. I was scared to at the last minute. Probably my good luck you did. My brains would be leaking out my ears. He saw the alarm on Danny's face and smiled. No harm done. What did it feel like to you? Like I was Nolan Ryan throwing a fastball, he replied promptly. You like baseball, do you? Halloran was rubbing his temples gingerly. Can you tell what your mom and dad are thinking, Danny? Halloran was watching him closely. Most times if I want to, but usually I don't try. Why not? Well, he paused a moment, troubled. It would be like peeking into the bedroom and watching while they're doing the thing that makes babies. Do you know that thing? I have had acquaintance with it, Halloran said gravely. They wouldn't like that, and they wouldn't like me peeking at their thinks. It would be dirty. I see, but I know how they're feeling, Danny said. I can't help that. I know how you're feeling, too. I hurt you. I'm sorry. It's just a headache. I've had hangovers that were worse. Can you read other people, Danny? I can't read yet at all, Danny said, except a few words. But Daddy's going to teach me this winter. I mean, can you tell what anybody is thinking? Danny thought about it. I can if it's loud, he said finally, like Miss Brant and the pants. Or like once when me and Mommy were in this big store to get me some shoes, there was this big kid looking at radios and he was thinking about taking one without buying it. Then he'd think, what if I get caught? Then he'd think I really want it. Then he'd think about getting caught again. He was making himself sick about it and he was making me sick. Mommy was talking to the man who sells the shoes, so I went over and said, Kid, don't take that radio. Go away. And he got really scared. He went away fast. Halloran was grinning broadly. I bet he did. Can you do anything else, Danny? It is only thoughts and feelings, or is there more? Cautiously. Is there more for you? Sometimes, Halloran said. Not often. Sometimes. Sometimes there are dreams. Do you dream, Danny? And I'm going to stop there. They go on with their conversation a little bit more. And I had to put the book down. A little shocked that what I was reading was that these characters were empaths. I'm pretty sure Stephen King wrote this book before empaths was a common term. So here we are to my Stephen King fantasy. And no matter if you resonate with his work or not, I think we've all got to appreciate his proliferation of work, his dedication to his craft. If he's too scary for you non-sensation seekers out there, I urge you to pick up his book on writing, A Memoir of the Craft, where he talks about how he has produced this much work, the importance of the support of his partner and wife. One of the things I learned from him is that partnership takes people to the next level. I learned that from his on writing book. But my Stephen King fantasy is that I want to interview him. I'm often advocating fiction as a teacher. It's why we've had fairy tales and myths since the beginning of time as a people. It's how we learn. It's how we grow. It's how we understand the human condition and ourselves and other people. We get into the heads of other people when we read stories about characters it's a very different way to learn and to be and to expand than just learning in a technical, through the mind, informational type of way. After reading that scene, I want to ask Stephen King if he's an empath or an HSP. And I want to know how he knew what I've known intuitively always. It's why I could relate to kids and sensitive kids, even as young as 11. How did he know to have this cook character speak to a five-year-old empath with respect and depth and insight. Many of you listening to the show I know can look back on your own development and you felt like little mini adults. Part of that is because the HSPs in the world, the empaths, the empaths, we are the wise old souls. We're just born that way. And I see that so beautifully in the scene that I read and shared with you. 
and the shining, I would want to ask him, where does this term come from? Do y'all think Stephen King made this term up, the shining that he shines? In my coursework and on the show, I talk about lighting up for each other. It's shining. I never knew from watching the movie that that's where the title came from. Was this shining? Them being emotional empaths. I want to talk to Stephen King about his creativity and his struggles with addiction. Because so many HSPs and empaths also struggle with addiction. We're struggling with what we feel and the weight of the world, what we control, what we don't control. I'd like to know what he thinks, if anyone else has ever told him that they use his writings, some of his scariest writings, to teach and to heal. I am often and continuously an advocate of more reading versus screen time. This is another example of how Hollywood and movie making to me misses the most important, the best damn part. I hope you liked this episode and it did something for you in connecting the dots and your path to healing. If anyone out there has a connection with Stephen King, please email us. Maybe through the power of this microphone and this community, we can manifest an interview with the great Stephen King. Why shoot for small when we can go big? So if you have that connection or if you're out there listening, please email us at production at emotionalbadass.com. I have such a love in my heart for writers and authors. I don't know that I would have survived my life without the tool of reading, the soft place it was for me to fall and escape into when my surroundings and my environment and some people around me were not. So if you know a young person that's struggling, put some books in their hands. There's a bit of magic in that. I want to thank you for listening. I want to invite you to come find our store at emotionalbadass.com. You can get your own Emotional Badass shirt. You can get a coffee mug. You can get a hat. It's really fun. I've had some pictures come in of people who have gotten some shirts and some hats and some other things. It's exciting to see the expansion. You're an Emotional Badass. I'm an Emotional Badass. And together... We are where Moxie meets Mindful. Continue to take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.